All right, hopefully we're live. Day three of the big birthday celebration. We're gonna have fun today. We're gonna do trivia at the end of this video. But first we thought we'd do something different and kind of fun. Um, we need to update some of the videos in Helicopterland Ground School. And I was wanting to come in today, I was gonna shoot a new one on cyclic, on the throttle, and on the collective. And I thought, you know what, let's just do it live today. So you'll see kind of behind the scenes of what's going on. Heather's going to be, be bopping around a couple cameras. And we got some others running. And uh, if it all comes out good, you're going to see us film in real time. The new video is going into the private pilot section, uh, lesson four, just on basic helicopter controls. And it's those videos in the private pilot section are really for somebody just starting out that really aren't sure what the controls do yet. And because uh, some people do join our course and start going through the videos before they even go to flight school which is really cool right because a lot of people show up and their instructors are impressed when they've already got a good some good first-hand knowledge of what's going on um i see daniel man daniel's almost always here awesome daniel so anything else i need to tell him before we go over in that was easy Awesome, there's Jason and Beach Geek. Yep, they're here all the time. So when we get to the trivia, we're, if we have enough people, we're gonna do at least 10 questions. If we have enough people competing, we'll do 15. So again, today, I like a check ride after the first five, top 10 check ride tips after that, and another Helicopter Land Ground School t-shirt. So Jason's got one, we just sent his today. Daniel, you got a shirt yet? And Beach Geek, do you have a shirt yet or a book? Kids got any, any uh, Gotta be quick. books or t-shirts. So yes, and we'll go over the rules of the road. It worked out really good last night. Everybody was playing fair and putting in, like when you answer 35, answer 35 dash and then A, B, C, or D. That way it's easy for us to identify who the actual first winner is. So, but we'll run through that again. We get ready to do those. So what we're gonna do now is as soon as I head over that way, Heather's gonna to go to the camera over there, right by where the controls are at. And I'm just gonna talk about the controls. And like I said, we got several cameras running, but you can see in real time what we do here when we make videos. So if you want to roll that camera, camera two, Heather, we'll come over here and uh, you know what? I should probably just make this one video actually because we've got all the controls here in one place. So maybe we'll just kind of run through them all, make this one video inside Helicopter Land Ground School. Might make it easy. So let's do this. Let's start with the collective. Um, almost any helicopter you're in, you're gonna have a lock on the collective. Some of them you can use in flight, some of them you can't. And something that's come up in the past uh, in a couple videos and some people have talked about collective popping up on them during a hover, or I'm sorry, during the startup and shutdown. And the first thing you need to know about the collective, the way I was taught from day one, from the time the blades start spinning until those blades stop, someone has their hand on that collective. In this one question, the, this uh, student was kind of upset. He's like, well, I took my hand off to change radios when I was doing my run-up and the collective come flying up on me. That's not right. And I had to be honest with him and say, look, you should not be taking your hand off the collective during run-up. Helicopters are different. This particular helicopter will pop up on you during the startup if it is not locked. The lock on this one is right down here. And we'll use this particular example, this helicopter. When you go through the checklist during your startup, there's about three times that they have you lock the collective or check it. And people say, well, I've already checked it. Well, there's a reason why they want you to check it three times on this aircraft because during that startup, at a certain point, you're gonna loosen it and you're gonna check it for freedom before you start. They want you to lock it again. And then there's a couple other times where you're gonna be doing things with your hands. So several times they want you to check it because it will I'm gonna unlock it and show you watch what will happen boom so somebody is always guarding that collective at all times and in this in a training process if you're a student either you have your hand on it or your instructor has your hand has hand on it and there's clear communication you know who's got their hand in that collective at all times 
and then once you start soloing as a student, if you have to set down and change some radios or something, you guard the controls, you lock your controls, and depending on the aircraft, you might have a different uh, you know, operation on how you do that. But for this helicopter, when you're by yourself, students are trained, our private pilots are trained, when they set down, if you're gonna take your hand off that collective, you have to have it locked. And what I was taught back in the beginning was to put your leg over here. When you're doing other things, at least if you have your leg over, if that collective pops up, you can catch it. At least start to catch it with your leg, and then hopefully get your hand there. Because sometimes people do, during a certain phase, forget that they locked it. So that's important understanding for your aircraft, what you're flying, what is the procedure for locking that collective. And this particular helicopter, you cannot lock that collective during flight. Some aircraft you can. The, another instrument model, the turbine model, has an actual friction, that's, uh, collective friction that's easier to move, and you can adjust it for a certain amount during flight. But that's a different model of aircraft. So in your training at your flight school, looking in your POH, you're gonna learn what happens with the collective as far as the friction and what is legal and what is not. But I'm telling you, you should always be guarding that collective. Someone always has their hand on that collective, okay? So the next thing I want to tell you about the collective is when we raise that collective, it is changing all three blades collectively on this aircraft. I'm actually going to have Heather go back to camera one because when I raise this collective, you'll be able to see that rotor blade in camera one actually increase and decrease. Okay, I see her thumbs up, so she's ready to go. So watch, as I raise that collective up, you can see that blade going up, right? Increasing its angle of attack. Same thing when I go down, going down, going down, it levels back up. So they call it the collective because it raises the angle of attack on all three blades collectively. Something different happens with the movements of those blades when we get talking about the cyclic, which we'll do here just shortly. So no, that's the job of the collective. When you raise it up, it's Changing all three of those blades at the same time, the same amount. Back down, decreasing that angle of attack, okay? Then the next trick is, and this can vary a little bit with helicopter to helicopter, but you realize now, this one's, you're using it at some purposes to go up and down, right? You're using it to lift it up off the ground. So the difficult thing, or let me try to think of this. The trouble that most people have when they, fart, when they first start learning the collective, is they want to start, they want to do this. They're overworking that collective. These collective inputs, a majority of the time, are going to be very small, very minute. When you're picking it up off the ground, it might be a little more than what some of the other movements are. Sometimes your movements are so slight going up and down that you're actually doing, where you're actually just, it's more like you're willing it to move, Yoda. You know, use the force, Luke. Sometimes it's more like you're willing it to move than you're actually moving it. So one of the things as a new student, be prepared to one of the things you're probably gonna do is too much up and down on the collective. These movements are gonna be nice and slow, okay? So that's kind of the basics of the collective. That's what it does, and that's the problems you're gonna normally have as a student, moving them too much. So understanding how much to move it, understanding how your friction lock works, when you can and cannot friction it, um, frictioning in flight, these are all things you need to find out for your specific aircraft. Now since we're here, let's just go ahead and talk about the throttle for a minute. Now again, depending on the make and model of aircraft that you're flying, there may be different procedures on how you handle this, but ultimately with a throttle, in most cases, this direction, moving your hand outward, is throttle on. Reducing is throttle off, okay? On this particular helicopter, we have a little, a little uh, knob on the top, so we know that's where our start index is. We know then that the detent's this way to roll it off, this way to roll on, and in this actual helicopter, you have on, off. Now, there's people that have different memory aids on how to turn that throttle, and some people compare it to a motorcycle, which I don't really like using that one because to me it's too different because I'm, you know, on a right hand, your motorcycle hand's going like this. This is your left hand. So there are different memory aids out there. You may hear different ones from the, 
flight school instructors that you are training with, but understanding the correct direction for throttle on, throttle off is key because if you make a throttle input the wrong way during flight, you could kill yourself by causing problems. Same thing with the collective. You could get, if you get over aggressive with that collective, some aircraft you could stall the rotor blades. So basic use of the throttle is this way for throttle on, this way for throttle off. And again, in the instrument, we even have it marked on off. You'll learn the different memory aids for what works for you. So basically what we're doing on this specific helicopter, I'll explain to you how it works. On this helicopter, we do not have a governor. And right outside the wind and storm is picking up like crazy. Hopefully we'll be able to use this, but we'll stay live and go ahead. Hopefully the noise isn't too loud. Let us know in chat if, if uh, you can hear that rain hitting the side of the hangar right now. It is freaking crazy. So what was I talking about? What was I saying? What was I saying, Heather? <laughs> I'm talking about the collective and the throttle. Yeah, she can't even hardly hear me over there. It's so loud in here. So basically with the throttle inputs, if you need more fuel, oh, I know where I was going. I remember now. It's calming down outside a little bit. This particular model of aircraft has a correlator. So what that means is, as you raise this collective up, the correlator is actually making throttle adjustments for you. Or not throttle adjustments, but fuel adjustments. It's adding more fuel as you go up, reducing fuel as you go down. So that's correlator versus governor. Governor does a totally different thing. We'll stick with this aircraft and then we'll talk about governor just real quick before we move on to the cyclic. But so these older model instruments back in the day, they didn't even have a correlator. So everything you did was the whole time you're going up and down with that collective, you were moving that throttle and doing a lot of work with it. But these correlators have gotten so darn good on these aircraft that basically when you go to pick it up, you set your RPM, you just start raising, just start raising, correlator takes care, care of the fuel adjustments, and then once you lift it up off the ground, it usually takes just a hair of a little bit of throttle to put it right in the green where you want it. And then if you're flying this aircraft the way it's intended to be flown, the movements are all really uh, very small and very minute, and if you learn those movements, life will be easy for you. If you make the collective movements big, then it's going to take more throttle adjustments. Same thing with the throttle. If you're screwing around with the throttle, then you're making the collective it can become more difficult. So learning the smooth balance between up and down, then how much you need to add and uh, decrease throttle is really key, especially in these helicopters. Each make and model is going to be a little bit different, but we're giving you the essence of what goes on with that throttle. RPM's a little bit low, we might be able to just add a little bit of throttle to just to bring that RPM right back up. RPM's high, we can go back off just a little bit of throttle or we can also raise or lower collective. Again, depending on the model of the aircraft. So, so it really varies. Now when you talk about a governor, like on the R-22 and the R-44, they're very common in training, most popular civil helicopter out there. As the pilot, you flip the governor on and then you just go out and fly and you just go up and down with the collective you almost never mess with that throttle because the governor is taking care of those throttle movements for you unless you have a governor failure or you got super aggressive with the controls you might have to overpower it but if you're flying that aircraft the way it's intended to be flown and you're making small smooth correct inputs once that governor's on you don't have to do anything other than go up down up down so that's kind of the essence there on the collective and the throttle. Cyclic. This one is kind of fun to talk about because, you know, this is the one that I think when you're training somebody, this one is the hardest one I think for people to learn and it was the hardest one for me to learn. I think the collective up and down makes a little more sense, makes some, you know, pretty simple sense. The throttle, you can learn those, they're minute. This is the tough one. So what we do when we start teaching you to fly, we go out and we give you a few minutes of just the pedals. We give you a few minutes of just the throttle. We give you a few minutes of just the collective and we give you a few minutes maybe with just the cyclic. And as you start gaining experience through your first several lessons, we'll give you more of each one and we'll start making combinations like, okay, you take the pedals, you take the cyclic and I'm gonna cover the collective for you. Or vice versa, and many instructors do that where we 
We just ease you in to learn these controls because you have to learn muscle memory so that you, when you're talking, you're thinking, you're working the radio, you're doing other things, your muscle memory is actually making these tiny, smooth inputs and you're not even really thinking about it. Because if you try to think, I'm talking on the radio and I'm looking downwind and I'm, it's too much for your brain to go, okay, I'm adding right pedal, I'm going up collective, my wrist is going this way, my hand is doing this, my thumb's on the trim. There are so many things there, you can't think of them all at the same time. So through muscle memory, you learn these movements and you learn how all these things coordinate together. And that's the trick to fly in these things. So basics of the cyclic, um, on this model we have a, a cyclic trim and we just have a new video that we uploaded inside the private pilot inside helicopter and ground school. I just uploaded a new one today, it was from the Coffee with Kenny video, ser video series where we had a really good video and I thought, you know what, that's good for the, uh, that's a good update for ground school. So I put that in today and notice these other videos were a little bit older so I thought, hey today while we're live let's shoot some of these. So we talk about the cyclic trim specifically in our private pilot course. But to give you an idea, there's motors underneath the seat. So if you have a aircraft with trim motors on it, there's motors underneath the seat, and you can actually move this through the motors. Oh, I need the trim switch on. But just to give you an idea, trim switch is on. There goes left. There goes right. Forward's not working. I hear him. Yeah. It's wanting to push it. So in, in essence, that's what these motors do. You, you use the trim to help take the force off the cyclic. Once you learn this, uh, how to use the trim, it makes life easy. And I'll give you an example. Let's say I'm just hovering that way and the wind's coming at me and keeps pushing me to the right. If I don't trim it, I'll have to keep pushing my, uh, my cyclic to the left towards the wind to counteract that wind. Pretty soon my arm's gonna get tired. So with that trim button, you just basically trim towards the wind. Wind's this way, pushing you, you got pressure going here, you trim towards that, and that moves that cyclic so it takes the pressure off your arm, and then you can just very easily manipulate that cyclic. So, depending on the different helicopters, you know, you got different looks of cyclics, but they all basically do the same thing. And for most aircraft, learning a nice gentle touch. In the beginning, you're gonna be on there like this, and you're gonna be manhandling that thing, going crazy like this. Learning how to do it with a real nice, smooth, gentle touch is key to learning the cyclic. In the end, or not in the end, later when you get good at it, there'll be times where you might just be on there real light with just a couple fingers. And when the weather's smooth and things are going good, you can do that as long as your hand's here. Sometimes it just takes little tiny movements, very small minute, cha minute changes, and I can fly the, most, the entire pattern in the instrum with just the trim. And I've done that video, it's actually on YouTube, and it's in our course. I can fly almost the whole entire uh, pattern with just making trim adjustments, except for going out of ETL and the end of the landing. So learning those small, tiny, minute changes with those is absolutely essential. Now what goes on here, when we move the cyclic in different directions, there's some things going on with the blades as well, but it's not like the collective where the collective moves all those blades collectively. And I'm going to give you a simple example here. I'm going to have Heather go back to that first camera. And I'm going to move the cyclic forward. Are you on camera one there, Heather? All right. So when I push cyclic forward, this will be hard for you to see in this video. Look how a little bit that, that blade is changing. Each one's changing a little bit. That one over there I can see moving a hair. And I can't see that blade back there. But in essence, if I want to start moving the helicopter forward, I need to increase the pitch in the rear and make the pitch um, decrease in the front, right? So the aircraft starts moving sideways. And the way a gyroscopic uh, unit moves, as in a helicopter rotor system, when you apply a force to a spinning object, it's felt 90 degrees later in the plane of rotation. If you're brand new, don't worry. This will make more sense to you later, but I just want you to understand that you're going to learn in the aerodynamics why they rig this the way they do. In this model of aircraft, if I want to go forward with the, if I want to go forward with the helicopter, I push gently, gently forward. I'm actually increasing the pitch over here because the helicopter rotor system doesn't feel that until what we call 90 degrees later in the plane of rotation. So I push forward, 
through the rigging, it increases the blade up there a little more than the other blades. So when there's more lift there, it's gonna be felt 90 degrees later, and that's how you move that direction. So that's forward flight. Let's back up to just uh, basically the hover. When you're learning how to hover, basically if you wanna move the helicopter to the left, you're gonna just put slight pressure to the left. You wanna to go to the right, slight pressure to the right. Same thing forward and backward during a hover. You wanna go forward, you're gonna push a little bit forward and a little bit back. So now you got an idea of what's going on through linkages and through the rotor system and you're changing pitches in the blade to get the um, aircraft to do what you want it to do. And you can even go like, you know, caddy cornered. If you want to go that way, you're going to push just a little bit that way. So learning this one, I think, is the toughest. And here's the toughest part, if I can explain this to you well. Basically, a helicopter wants to act like a pendulum. So when you start learning, you start doing this, okay? So what you have to learn to do is, let's say, for purposes of this video, let's say I'm going this way and this way. So when I go, I'm, I'm getting kind of squirrely in the hover, and I go this way, I have to push the cyclic back to the right to stop that sideways movement. But because it's going like this, I push it to the right to stop that movement. But then if I don't do anything, then the helicopter's gonna go right back that way. And then I'm gonna have to stop that one. So then I'm gonna do this. So pretty soon you're going back and forth, back and forth. And all you're doing is going like this. So you have to learn this, this slight movement of, let's say we're going that way and you're going up. I push to the right a little bit to stop that. You, when it starts to level out, you have to almost go back to a neutral, if that would make sense to you. Otherwise, you just keep doing this. So, in essence, during a hover, you're using this to go forward, backwards, that way, that way. In forward flight, you're using it to turn to the left, turn to the right. You can pull a little bit aft to, to climb. And you can push forward just to, eh, I'm not even going to say that. You want to learn basically in most aircraft, most of your up and down wants to be here. You're not normally going to use a cyclic to change, uh, to climb or descend because you're going to get in a bad habit if you start moving the cyclic forward. You're going to learn that you should never make a large forward of input on a cyclic because you can get into something called low G. And we talk about that more later in the course. And you'll learn about that through your course of training, no matter where you're at or where you're studying you're gonna learn about low G. So there's a, a condition that can happen that we never ever wanna make a forward abrupt movement on, that, on the cyclic. So in normal flight, we're gonna change altitude by up and down collective and be using basically the cyclic to keep us level. We're gonna use it to turn left, turn right. We're gonna use it to slow down. We're gonna use it um, during our auto rotation practice where you learn how to land without power. We come in on a glide and then we actually flare the helicopter. So you're gonna to learn to go a little bit aft on the cyclic, depending on the day and the aircraft, could be more, could be less, but you're gonna learn that. You're gonna learn in, in a, what we call a quick stop to quickly deaccelerate the helicopter. You're gonna learn that aft movement. So there's a lot of little things that you're gonna learn when you go out and start training in the aircraft and don't let this one overwhelm you. Instructors usually have little little sayings or little tidbits of information that's going to help you learn this. And I remember, you know, my instructor saying, use the force, Luke. It's more like you're willing it to move than you're actually moving it. Awesome. Well, hey, the rain calmed down. I'm going to walk over and see what Heather's got going on, see what kind of questions any of y'all got out there. But there's some pretty good little video there, and we'll, we'll see how it comes out because who knows with that rain, that was a little bit crazy. Looks like everything's still good to go. I don't have any big uh, questions to answer, Heather. Anybody make anything exciting in there? I think so. People saying hi. They said they heard you loud and clear even the rain. Awesome. <laughs> 32 people? Heck yeah. Nice. All right. Keep those thumbs up going. That little icon below the video. Click that dude. Thumbs up. Give us some more of them. Hell yeah. All right. We'll get to the trivia then. That was fun. So I'm going to go over here. Today, Heather's back to help me do this. Use the force, Luke. So here's the deal. When we go through the questions, make sure you answer example 35 is where we left off last night. You answer 35-C or whatever it is. I can't see it from where I'm standing. But when you start playing, that's how we're going to do it. So we're going to start with uh, question 36. 
And when we get to question 40, that will be a giveaway round. First one's top 10 check ride tips. And we'll do four more freebies where you compete against each other. And then, so then 45, helicopter check ride. Then if we got some good players, which I think we will, we got 35 people in here now, awesome. On question 50, we will give away helicopter online ground school t-shirt. So this is a good live event. Things are going good. Audio's looking good. Looks like everybody's here. So Heather, go ahead and bring up the screen for the written testing. I'm just going to walk over here by you so I can make sure we got, yep. Yes, audio is working. So keep an eye on that, Heather. Make sure that keeps going. But I think we solved the problem that I had last night. I do want to mention on this question, and I wanted to mention this last night, from last night, how long should a pilot avoid bright lights prior to night flight? 20 to 30 minutes, 30 minutes is what I was trained many years ago. When I was flying EMS and we went through our night vision uh, goggle training, our Czech airman said, you know what? That should really read an hour. And his, you know, through the training and, and our training in night vision goggles, he said, it really takes more like a full hour for someone to become uh, adjusted at night. So food for thought, 20 to 30 minutes is a good answer. I would say 30 minutes, hours even better. So let's mark that one. Okay. All right. So again, we're going to do 36, 37, 38, 39, let you guys and girls compete against each other. And then on question 40, we will give away top 10 check ride tips. So here we go. Question 36. What is the minimum fuel reserve in a helicopter for VFR flight? 30 minutes day, 60 minutes at night, 40 minutes whether day or night, enough fuel for the helicopter to have continued flight for 20 minutes, 20 minutes daytime, 45 minutes at night. Anybody answer yet, Heather? Michael, 36B. Oh, then you put er, C. Here we go with the correct answer. Whoever answers, well, first one in line, because don't be guessing, I've read it. So here we go. The answer is C. So the first person that got C is the winner of that one. Yeah, A, C, B, C, C. All right. This one you need to know, people. 20 minutes, day or night, you got to know that. Every single examiner is going to ask you that question on every single check ride, anytime, anywhere. And if you ever get ramp checked, they're going to ask you about that 27 minutes. Oh, tip. Don't click over until you're ready to read it because they... Oops. They're reading it before you. That's okay. That's right. You're right. I got... Uh, <laughs> Good call, Heather. All right. What is the term that describes the tendency for a pilot to be nearsighted in night conditions? Is it A, autokinesis, B, spatial disorientation, C, night myopia, or D, none of the above? The answer is night myopia. I will admit, last night, you know, I went through these. The, the eye questions always get me. Um, I, I, that's one of those things I have to go back and study. Some things I remember forever. Things that come to do with the eyes, I always have to go back and study that stuff. All right, so we're going to do a couple more before the giveaway. Let's go to the next one. What do we got? Here we go. What is the minimum amount of time that must have passed since a pilot has last consumed alcohol? Six hours and blood alcohol content below 0.04. Four hours and the blood alcohol content must be below 0.04. Eight hours and the blood alcohol content must be below 0.04. 24 hours and the blood alcohol content must be below 0.04. I'll bet you we got some people answering this one. We should have because everybody needs to know this yeah, one. It is C. Now, 24 hours, some, some companies may have a rule that says, if you fly for us, you can't drink for 24 hours prior to flight. So if you've mastered D, that is that it can be a company restriction. But for the FAA regs, it is eight hours bottle to throttle, we like to say, and your blood alcohol content must be 0.04 or less. All right. How's everybody doing? We got a lot of people answering? Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Here we go for 39. And then the next one will be a giveaway. 
So here we go. What type are the three types of main rotor systems on helicopters? A, firm, flexible, and hinged. B, semi-rigid, fully flexible, and firm. C, rigid, semi-rigid, and fully articulated. And D, industrial, experimental, and trainer. So I want to make sure some people are answering before I say yeah, what it is. Everybody's saying C. C is correct. And you'd be surprised how many people will mess this one up. It is rigid, semi-rigid, and fully articulated. Those are the three types. There are some others too, but these are the three main types. When somebody goes, well, what about, you know, dual coaxial, blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, there are some others, but these are the three main types of common rotor systems. All right, here we go for, I believe we're doing top 10 check ride tips on this one. So we are going to do question 40. This is for a book. So be ready, people. Here we go. First one to answer in chat. Make sure you have the answer of 40, of 40 dash and the answer. Here we go. Which most accurately describes a fully articulated rotor system? A, each blade is allowed to flap, feather, lead, and lag. B, the blade, blades flap as a unit. C, the blades bend in order to compensate for Coriolis. D, fully articulated systems are the only rotor systems that flap. Got some answers going in there? Yep. All right. Well, A is correct. H blade is allowed to flap, feather, lead, and lag. All right, so the winner, Michael, type up. You're going to want to email Heather, and Heather will type it in the chat box. Make sure you get her name right, because I screwed it up on here. I, uh, when you look on the screen, it says Heather. I screwed up. I typed that. So she'll type in her email. You send her your address, and she will ship you top, rent, top 10 check ride tips. All right, so we got a winner. Let's keep going. Let's do another one. The next one is, which is true concerning semi-rigid rotor systems? A, the blades on a semi-rigid system do not flap. B, the blades on a semi-rigid system are always numbered three or more. C, the blades in a semi-rigid rotor system flap as a unit. Or D, the blades in a semi-rigid rotor system are allowed to lead and lag on a hinge. C is correct. The blades in a semi-rigid rotor system flap as a unit. You'll get that question on about every single private pilot check ride. He won again? Well, he didn't. He won this. Yeah. Oh, we're not. Okay, yeah, we're not giving away. Okay. He's the only one that got that correct. Nice. All right. Let's keep going. Which best describes a rigid rotor system? A, the blades on a rigid system flap and feather through blade bending. B, the blades on a rigid system flap as a unit. C, each blade on a rigid system is allowed to flap and feather on a hinge. And D, rigid rotor systems are non-existent and of no concern of mine. It's not that one. All right, we got some answers in there, Heather? The answer is A, the blades on a semi-rigid system flap and feather through blade bendings. Bending. Nice, he's on it. Awesome. All right, let's keep it rolling. Oh, I got to answer it. Nice. All right, next question. What is the symmetry of lift? A, the equalization of lift across the rotor system. B, lead and lag of a rotor blade. C, unequal lift across the rotor system, and D, the term used to describe how a blade bends. C, and one B. The answer is C, unequal lift across the rotor system. And nice. when the ex I've been training people for years. When the examiner asks you that, it's unequal lift across the rotor system. And there's other things you can state, but that's sim very simply what it is. It's unequal lift across the rotor system. Don't dig until the examiner asks you to dig more. You give him a short answer and move on. If he wants more, he'll dig for it. All right, so I got to answer that one. Unequal lift cross rotor system. All right, let's do 44, and then we're going to give away a book. How does the rotor system compensate for the symmetry of lift? A, the pilot must increase and decrease pitch to compensate for the symmetry of lift. 
B, the dissymmetry of lift is equalized with blade flapping. C, dissymmetry of lift is corrected with Coriolis effect. And D, dissymmetry of lift is not corrected and does not affect flight. The answer is B. <laughs> the symmetry lift is equalized with blade flapping. Examiner will ask that question. He'll ask you, well, how does the rotor system compensate for that? It is through blade flapping. Okay, helicopter check ride on the next question on number 45. Everybody ready? All right, here we go. Number 45. Remember, this one's for a book. Helicopter check ride, so here we go. What accur accurately describes translating tendency, and people mess these up all the time, the tendency of a helicopter to drift in the direction of tail rotor thrust during a hover, B, the tendency of the helicopter to drift in the direction of tail rotor th thrust at approximately 10 knots, C, the tendency of a helicopter to drift in the direction of tail rotor thrust on a steep approach, and D, the tendency of the helicopter to drift in the direction of the tail rotor thrust in cruise flight of 60 knots or better. We you, have four A's, one C, and one B. It is A, tendency of the helicopter to drift in the direction of tail rotor thrust during a hover. This is part of the three C's that everybody screws up. So who's our winner? Scott Farkas answered C or A first. Nice. We're breaking it up with winners then, all right? Yep. All right. Helicopter check ride. So again, email Heather at helicopterground.com. Don't use the spelling I have here on the page because that's incorrect. Heather at helicopterground.com. Give her your address and she will ship that tomorrow because she's getting ready to go. As soon as we get done here, she's out of here. She's staying late for you guys and girls. Um, I asked her to stay a little bit late so we could get this done. No problem. All right. So one more round, and then we give away the Helicopter Line Ground School t-shirt. So let's do it. Question 46 of 100. How is translating tendency compensated for? A, the pilot must make cyclic inputs to keep the helicopter in position. B, the manufacturer handles the problem with mast rigging. C, both A and B are correct, depending on the helicopter manufacturer. D. There's no need to compensate for translating tendency as it occurs only, use it only occurs at 10 knots. All right, we got some answers in there. Yep, we have C, A's, and 1B. C is the answer. And I can tell you firsthand, flying the BK-117, we had to compensate for that. Big, expensive, twin engine helicopter, and it was a badass helicopter, but it was not built in. We did that manually. The Enstrom handles it with rigging of the mast. So it depends on the aircraft. So both A and B are correct. Next question. Which describes dynamic rollover? The helicopter pivots on a point other than the center of gravity and experiences a rolling moment. B, the helicopter catches a skid on something or one skid may be stuck to the ground due to mud, ice, etc. C, a first time solo pilot without counterbalance allows the helicopter to reach or exceed five to eight degrees of lateral difference when the pilot lifts into a hover. Got some answers? B's and one person says a trick or This is not a trick. Let me double check here. But I don't think this is a trick. And I'm not sure if I should tell you yet. Well, this is, there's no... D's and D's. Okay, good, we got D's. It is D. All of the above are true. Awesome. All right, two more freebies and then the t-shirt, and we're done. All right, 48. Which is the only way to attempt recovery from a dynamic rollover? A, promptly lower the collective all the way. B, center the cyclic control. D, reduce throttle. I mean, C, reduce throttle. D, if RPM is in the green, lick, 
lift, lick. <laughs> Licking the collective ain't gonna do you no good. Lift, lift, collective, and hover. Uh, we have A's. All right. That, A's I will tell you, I had an examiner once say, have you heard the new way you uh, get out of dynamic, dynamic rollover? It's a three-step process. I'm like, no, what is it? And he goes, down collective, down collective, down collective. That's your only answer. Lower the collective. 49. Oh, I know this one firsthand. I was ejected from an aircraft. I know all about it. What is ground resonance? A, ground resonance is when the helicopter shakes violently from being out of phase. B, ground resonance is considered an approved steep approach. Ground resonance is only an airplane problem, and ground resonance is, is when the helicopter enters low G. I hope everybody gets this one right. And if you don't know this one, then, and you're flying a fully articulated radar system, you better be finding out what this is. Answer. Yeah, it looks like everybody's saying A. Hey, good. Everybody knows what it is. Violent. Oh my God, is this violent. But hey, that's for another day. I've actually have a video out there on that. Okay, here we go. Last round. Last giveaway. This is for the Helicopter Line Ground School t-shirt. And then we are going to roll a short video giving you the details of our current birthday sale right now because people ask for that. And they've been at the end. Hey, go over, go over the sale again. We haven't mentioned it until just now. Well, let's get this t-shirt done. So here we go. This is for the t-shirt. Last question. What is the correct pilot action if ground resonance begins? A, the pilot should do nothing. B, the pilot should roll throttle off completely if the RPM is below the green operating range. C, the pilot should lift to hover if RPM is in the green operating range. D, both B and C are correct. Uh, so far we have two Ds. That is it. C, D. Both B and C is correct. You got it. You get the aircraft flying if you're already at RPM. If you're not at an RPM, throttle off, collective down. Michael's the winner again. Awesome. He's quick. Awesome, Michael. Well, let's see. We now we need when you email Heather for your book. Also tell her t-shirt size. T-shirt size because she'll just send you that in the same box. Yep. And uh, you'll be good to go. And the we might have to come t-shirts. We got a shipment coming, so the books we have, the t-shirts aren't in yet. So she'll probably wait and just ship that for you together just to save us, you know, a couple bucks versus shipping twice. But I promise those are on order and they will be here. So. Yes. All right. If you'd come back to my camera for just a second, Heather, and then get that little, little video clip going. So we are celebrating eight years online, most all of you know. In case you don't know, and you just came back, or you're coming on to our training, we're celebrating eight years online. Eight years, March 1st, 2012 is when I launched. Launched, so Sunday was eight years online. It was birthday for Helicopter Line Ground School. And we're having a party here every day until the 15th on my birthday. We have the biggest discounts going right now, more than ever. If you would, pull that video up and have it ready for us, Heather. And this is just a couple minutes. It'll tell you exactly what we offer and exactly what the discount is and how to get it. So hang around, check it out if you're interested. And uh, we'll, any other questions, bring them up and I'll, and I'll answer them, but I can turn Heather loose after this. So roll that video and we'll be back. birthday special is 50% off any membership our biggest discount we have ever offered so to break down the memberships our basic option is private pilot you can get that monthly you can go month to month you can cancel any time first month 50% off then it goes to the normal price again keep as long as you like cancel any time or there's the unlimited option only only back for our special sale it will be gone at the end of the cell. Private pilot, unlimited, you keep it, no expiration, 50% off. Then next is commercial pilot. And note, this includes the private. So you get private pilot and commercial pilot. Again, you can go monthly or unlimited. Monthly, 50% off the first month. Keep as long as you like, cancel any time. Or the unlimited, you'll keep the private and the commercial. 
no expiration right now, 50% off. Next, certified flight instructor. This includes the private pilot. This includes the commercial pilot. Again, you can go monthly, 50% off that first month, or unlimited, you keep private, commercial, and CFI, you keep them, no expiration, 50% off until the end of this sale. Instrument pilot, we built this after all the courses were already up, so this is a stand alone. You can get it when you need it, keep as long as you like, cancel any time, first month, 50% off, then to the normal price, again, cancel any time, or unlimited where you just keep it, hang on to it, no expiration, that right now, 50% off. Then here's the big one. This one is the one that is hot on this cell. So far from launch, professional pilot, includes private, includes instrument, includes commercial, and certified flight instructor. That is the professional pilot membership. That's unlimited, there's no expiration. You keep all of those, private, instrument, commercial, and certified, certified flight instructor. You keep them, they do not expire right now, 50% off. And for Clarence, who always brings us up during our live events, you get with private commercial or CFI or the professional, you get our Robinson R-22 training, our Robinson R-44 training, and our Enstrom helicopter specific training. That's available to you in your library with private commercial or CFI or professional. So what do you do? You need the code KK50. That is 54, 50% off. You enter that in the coupon box during checkout and it will reveal the 50% discounted price off of any one of those options. Helicopterground.com, do it now. All right, we should be back. Uh, Heather brought up a question. Somebody asked about during that pendular effect, if your ties into gyroscopic precession, you're overthinking it. Just know that the aircraft is going to make, when you're first learning, this is what you're going to be doing. And everybody does it. In the beginning, you're just going, whoa, whoa. And it could be any direction, right? So as I was stating earlier in that video, when you go, let's say you go swinging this way, you're going to, let's see, it's hard to do. I'm not sitting in the helicopter. You're going this way. You go to the right to counteract that. If you don't do anything, then it goes back this way again. So all you're doing is doing just like this. So when you go up, you counteract, and then back to like almost neutral to level it out. Otherwise, you just keep going. Everybody goes through that. Very common, happens to people, and you will get over it. So there's the deal on our birthday special. This is a big deal. And that's why we went 50% in the... Professional pilot's the hot one right now. People are jumping on that. And I've even had people email me and go, Kenny, I've been wanting the professional pilot for a long time. And thank you for making this sell so good because it was just, I couldn't pull it off before. And now I've joined as a professional pilot member and they're all really, really happy. We do have 100% money back 30 day iron clad, clad gear and T by the way. But people are utilizing the unlimited on the private commercial CFI instrument and they're Taking, they're taking us up on that uh, monthly for the first month half off. And know that you can unsubscribe yourself or you can just keep the training and go to the normal billing. billing. So it's awesome. All right, well, I'm gonna wrap it up because uh, that was a good live event. Last night I had a lot of trouble, but I, I did it myself with no Heather and I'd been here like 14 hours and I was just so tired I had you know, a few mistakes, but it was still fun, had a good turnout. Thanks everybody, subscribe to the channel, and when you do, make sure you click the bell. That will be, we notified of more giveaways up and through the 15th, some, do some more trivia, as long as people are coming back and enjoying it, we'll keep doing it. Um, you wanna tell Scott if, if it's still not working, just to email you, he's saying he got some sort of a weird blacklisted by internal reputation service, I told him to try it again, I got Michael's mind. For emailing, for emailing Heather at helicopterground.com? Mm -hmm. Try Kenny at helicopterground.com. There shouldn't be any problem. He said he's going to try a different email. <clears throat> I see Beach Geek, Beach Geek. I've had a, a CPL since late 80s, but no CFI. Kenny, have an open slot. Um, I'm, maybe. I'm not doing a lot of... I'm so busy with running the site and updating videos, and I enjoy flying and making videos. 
I haven't done any training yet. Um, maybe in a few weeks, I got to get through this cell and there's a lot of video that I got to get shot for the site with the helicopter while it's sitting there all nice and pretty. And God, I love training and I want to. I will say this, give me a month and then check in and see what's going on. If I don't have anybody, I usually do um, one or two people in the spring and early summer. And that's what I do each year. Um, I can't take students full time because I have to run helicopter on ground school. As much as I love to fly and I love training, I usually do one or two ratings a year for members. So if you're a member and you want to come fly with me, uh, looking at about a month, let me get through the cell. And uh, actually it'd be into April because we got something big coming the end of the month that we have to prepare for, for the week or two after the cell. We've got to get some things in order for a big, uh, we'll just say the end of the month, the first week of April, I we've tied up, but you'll be hearing from us, but we've got some big stuff going on here and it's going to be a big change. Probably one of the biggest things to help move, ground school move forward and it's something that a lot of members are going to really benefit from and they're going to like. They're going to like it a lot, but I'm going to hold that thought. Awesome. Cool. Subscribe to the channel, click the bell. I'll get Heather ready to click the button to end it. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Come back and see us. Subscribe. Click the bell.